And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? It's Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher teaching in the Los Angeles area. This is my 17th year in the classroom, and this, of course, is All the Above, your home for news and analysis of all matters pertaining to our world of education. We want to extend a warm welcome to anybody who is joining our show as a new listener or viewer. Perhaps you came across our show after our previous guest, Jose Luis Wilson, came on and dropped a lot of dopeness related to math and anti-racism. So we want to welcome you to our show. If you're listening to the podcast, do consider going to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash all of the above, so you can check out our dope setups. Jeff, these setups are, are working out pretty well so far. Yes, they are, man. Well, looking, uh, looking fresh and clean, looking brand new. And I know some folks who were uh, who watched our last episode uh, and saw the new studio setups might be looking at today's episode and be like, "Hey, I thought you already just had new studios." Do you got new, new studios again? Um, and the answer is thanks to all of our incredible supporters who went to aotashow.com slash support and signed up to contribute on Venmo or Cash App or subscribed via Anchor. Um, we have been able to purchase some nice adaptable equipment that lets us experiment with some different looks. So we're going to be testing some things out here um, over the course of uh, this year's episodes and keeping it fresh and new from time to time. Yeah, definitely. So again, shout out to everybody who's extended their support for our show so we could continue to create this content and get it out to y'all, despite the fact that we're not in our, our usual studio setup because of the pandemic, of course. And also, um, we want to let all of you know who are new to our show that if you went to our website, you see that we have covered so many topics in education because we like to center critical conversations about what's going on in our schools. So definitely after checking out this, this episode, please go ahead and dig through those crates and see all the important conversations we've had with so many super dope guests. And all that being said, Jeff, what do we have on the agenda for this episode? Well, man, well, as usual, we got a good one for everybody. And I am personally very excited for today's episode. I know you are as well, uh, yeah. because as you know, you being a current social science teacher, me being a former social studies teacher, uh, we are people who sp have spent you know lots of our career uh, helping to engage students in text and in critical engagements with different types of text. So we have two guests today who who are experts in that, and in this kind of national climate where everybody's you know talking about. We've got to make the curriculum anti-racist, and that's great. These are two folks who really bring some expertise to the table on, okay, well, so now that the school year is here, what does that look like, right? And how do individual teachers, teacher teams, schools as a community via their library or that sort of thing, how do schools actually tackle this? So we have two amazing guests. We have Julia Torres. Many of you may know her uh, from some appearances she made on lots of webinars and things over the course of the summer. Um, she is a teacher and librarian out in Denver, Colorado. And joining us as well, we have our amazing senior middle school correspondent. You know her, you love her, Genevieve DuBose, middle school literacy coach, and also one of the uh, founders of Project Lit Watts um, here in the Los Angeles area. So two incredible guests. You definitely want to stick around. Don't want to miss today's discussion. Super dope. So last episode, we talked about mathematics and anti-racism. Looks like we're going, to, we're going to be looking at literacy this episode. Jeff, it really sounds like this show is um, interdisciplinary. That's pretty dope. Yes, indeed, Manuel. You know, we, um, you know, we like to cover a broad set of bases here on All the Above. Yeah, for sure. All right, folks, so going to be a dope episode. Up first, we have our Do Now, where we take a look at recent headlines in the world of education particularly looking at stories that you might have missed. Stay tuned. All right, folks, now it's time for today's Do Now, where we take a look at recent headlines in the world of education. Jeff, how are we going to do the Do Now today? Well, Manuel, today, you know, here in California at least, it's a couple weeks into the school year, and I know every district across this state is grappling with the big essential question 
of attendance, right? We're trying to figure out who's here, what does it mean to attend when it's you know virtual school versus hybrid school versus physical school. So uh, in the spirit of grappling with attendance, we got a roll call today, Manuel. We gotta see who's in the house. All right, roll call. Attendance has never been more difficult for me as a teacher. I'll tell you that our system now yeah. is like totally absent or a range of one through five, depending on what the kid did that day. And yeah, it's just, it's a mess, Jeff, but it's yeah, important to no, know it's... who's engaging and who's not. So let's go ahead and do this roll call. Who we have first on today's roll call? Well, first we actually have three names, Manuel. We have June, July, and August. Hmm. Those used to be my three favorite months until I grew up and had to start paying energy bills and global warming yeah. and all that. And it's so hot nowadays that um, I'm more of a winter person now. But yeah, all right. Summertime, sounds like. Yeah. Well, let's, there's an important asterisk next to that wintertime person, which is you live in Los Angeles. Yes. <laughs> where the clarify. winter is not winter. Southern California so, wintertime. That's, yeah. that's the type of winter I'm talking about. A nice, right. brisk, like 68, <laughs> 69 degrees on a cold day. That, that works yes. for me now. Which is what the rest of the country knows as spring. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we got going on here in L.A. But um, let's, let's get into this story, Manuel. So uh, today's story about June, July, and August is brought to us by uh, some good reporting by Darcy Sprague uh, in the Heckinger Report. And uh, of course, everyone knows that the global pandemic has raised big concerns about learning loss. And, uh, you know, in particular, the learning loss that we saw at the end of last school year. And now there's even concern potentially about, you know, summer loss compounding that as well. And of course, even in a normal year, uh, teachers across the country are used to seeing and grappling with some of that, quote, summer slide, right? As students return to their classroom with some diminished knowledge after the, the long summer break. Now, estimates vary greatly, but there uh, is a bit of an emerging consensus that the the so-called COVID slide could be even more pronounced than the traditional summer slide, especially among low-income as well as black and brown students. One estimate from uh, NWEA predicts that up to a year of learning loss could be possible for some students. Nationally, educators and officials have floated one possible solution, which is moving to year-round school. Now, under this model, which has existed in parts of the country for decades now, um, schools would operate with shorter, more frequent breaks throughout the course of the school year, rather than just one lengthy, you know, roughly two-month summer vacation. Now, uh, while research on this model's effectiveness is mixed, proponents argue that it keeps vulnerable students from falling further behind and ensures that students benefit more consistently from things like uh, school meals and other services that are often a bit of a challenge for families to access in the summer months when schools are shut down and school staff um, are, are not working. Um, so, man, well, I'm very curious to get your your take on this. The you know potentially growing calls for exploring these you know these year round models of school. Um, you know, some some folks make the claim that like education is based on this agrarian model that we've had forever, and you know how, why are we still doing this ancient thing that doesn't apply to today's context. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's a complex question. So I'm very curious, what's your take on this issue of possibly going to year round school as a solution to the, the summer slide and the COVID slide? Yeah. So this is particularly interesting because you and I have not discussed the story and I really have zero idea where you stand on this. <laughs> so what I'm about to say, it, it might be something that we, we disagree. We don't disagree on a lot, people, folks who are listening or watching. Um, but there are a few things that we disagree on. And maybe this is one of them. I don't know. All right. So as a elementary schooler and middle schooler, I attended a school that was on a year round model. So first oh, wow. of all, about the whole okay. conversation about learning loss, I am really, really afraid as a classroom teacher about what the impact is going to be if we all just blanketly accept that this huge learning loss is happening and we have to do what we can to address it because part of me thinks well the learning loss it should be happening around the world because schools around the world are closed and when catastrophes have happened in the past and schools have to, had have had to shut down for natural disasters or war or what have you 
from my understanding, research shows that eventually those kids um, were able to catch up in the in the years after. So I don't want to just totally change things out of fear for learning loss because I know that could be weaponized by a lot of folks who are going to want to like double the math and English and strip maybe some of the electives because we got to catch up for all the lost learning. And I just know how how that can be weaponized by some folks. Now, Jeff, I know you wouldn't weaponize it in that way. So, you know, obviously um, any ideas that you have about addressing it, I, I will well, I'm, hear those I'm thinking out. we should. I'm thinking we should just cancel recess for all elementary school no recess, kids for like, no, for like the next two years to just do reading and math. What do you think about that? And, and working lunches. <laughs> like, why are we sending them to the cafeteria for lunch? They should be at their desk eating lunch yes. as they work. You are, you, yes. You're onto something there. Um, but no, I mean, all that aside, I mean, as far as a year round model, my wondering is, well, the research is mixed, right? So uh, typical summer break, even though we, we imagine it to be three months, in my experience, summer break has, has largely been about two months. And my year round schooling experience, we had one month off at a time. So three months on and then one month off. So I'm curious, what is the difference in so-called learning loss between one month and two months like at what on what day does the loss become like something major is it that much of a difference to totally reorganize the school year so i'm curious about that but um you know when i was in a, a year-round school it was because of overcrowding so we had four different tracks track a b c and d and any given month one track was off so that the other three tracks could like fit on campus so it was not done for for learning loss at all but i'm really curious about this idea of having a, a rotating or year round school year to address learning loss, because I don't know that having a month off versus two months does anything for learning loss. And I'm definitely open for reconsidering whether or not a full chunk of summer should be off, you know, to speak, you know, to speak, well, speaking of your like idea of the old agrarian model that so many folks talk about, I'm up for that discussion, but I'm not up for a year round discussion because of COVID, because I just don't think that's going to address whatever loss might be happening. I don't know. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah. So I, I think largely we agree, um, but I, I will. So I'm very interested to hear that you went to a year round school and and then as you were talking, it, it reminded me like, of course you did, because you attended school in California yeah. and California at one time had the, you know, the sort of shining pinnacle of public education from K to college. Uh, of any state in the nation. And then, of course, you know, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan and the California Republicans brought you massive defunding of public school and public infrastructure and all the like, you know, goodies of racism and oppression baked in that brought us massively overcrowded, in particular, urban schools serving yep. black and brown students yep. where you had, you know, 5,000 kids in a school that could only hold 3,000. So you had to have track A, B and C and go year round. Right. So. I'm 100 percent against, uh, you know, replicating any any aspect of that oppressive system because because it was cool logistically or whatever. And I fully hear you on the weaponization of the so-called covid slide. I think what's really interesting that I would love somebody to explore and I have not heard anyone out there like I don't know, Linda Darling Hammond, um, any of those kind of folks out there running these institutes who have doctoral students and researchers. I am I am definitely interested in, in what the so-called COVID slide is. I'm also very interested in what have kids been learning while they've been spending way more time with their family and getting potentially much more individualized attention from an adult who True. loves and cares about them than they would have otherwise gotten. Right. And I don't say that to disparage school. I love school as an institution, but I think we're making a faulty assumption and saying like kids aren't learning, weren't learning anything. Right. Kids were yeah. learning a lot of stuff. Now, whether that was like how to cook for the family or whether that was how to like build and fix stuff around the house or whether that was just reading a lot more or whether that was you know, social cooperation because they're spending all these time, all this time with their siblings and their cousins cramped up in the house because nobody could go anywhere or whatever. Yep. Um, I think we also have to expand the conversation to think about what did kids gain during this time when they were doing stuff, just not stuff at school. Um, so in terms of the actual like, uh, you know, what do I think about a year round school model? I actually explored this possibility at, at one point in my life, Manuel, years, years back, I thought about the possibility of uh, of starting a school. And uh, we were considering for that um, doing a year round school model, very similar to what you named. So something like, you know, um, 
two to three months on and then like three weeks off. Um, and then when you bake in the, all the holidays and things over the course of the year, it, it, it roughly works out to something like a, a kind of quarter system. What I loved about that idea most, in addition to the potential of addressing learning loss, is you can build in more time for teachers to collaborate, for the adults at school to work together, to plan, yeah. look at data, plan to respond to that data, et cetera, which is so ridiculously, shamefully, unethically absent in our current school oh, yeah. calendars in every district that I'm aware of across the country. So for that reason alone, I think it's worth exploring, but I agree with you, we gotta be careful about the like weaponization of learning loss in this moment. Yeah, for sure. And uh, if I may have a quick story about my experience being at a year round yeah. school, because it, it recently got kicked back up when I ran into somebody that I didn't realize was a, a teacher at, at my middle school. So, you know, when we shifted the track, so I think from grade, uh, up until grade four, we were a traditional calendar, and then it became a year-round calendar, and parents were given a choice of which track they wanted, A, B, C, or D, and I ended up on A track. Now, immediately, it, it seemed to be that there was some difference between the kids who ended up on A track and B track and the kids who ended up on C track and D track, especially in middle school. In middle school, it was clear to us, little middle schoolers, that like A track had a lot of the students who generally speaking did okay in school and were more or less responsible. And D track was like the opposite. Like D track was the hood, like for real, for, I mean, every track, I mean, the whole school was hood, but D track for sure, as middle schoolers, we looked at D track like, man, that's like, that's, that's the real hood right there. And as I grew up and as my friends grew up, we looked back at that and thought, I wonder if they purposely tracked us in that kind of way. Like, I wonder if we ended up on tracks based on our test scores or something more so than our parent preference or what have you. And I had the good fortune of running into somebody who was a teacher at that time in D track at my middle school. And, you know, I didn't know this person at the time. We didn't, you know, I was on A track, so I didn't have any D track teachers. But, you know, at, when we both found out that we were both at that same school at the same time, me as a teacher and this person as, I mean, me as a student and this person as a teacher, I asked them, what was it like to teach on D track? Because we looked at D track as being like the really, really tough track. And this person said, yeah, we noticed that also. And to my knowledge, they didn't track you guys in terms of test scores or anything. We think it had to do with the parent preference part because a track was a schedule that was most similar to a regular traditional schedule. Our month off, we had July off. So smack dab in the middle of the summer, we had March off, which, which, uh, you know, uh, ran up to spring break. Like our, our, months off tended to be a little closer to what we normally had and D track was like the worst schedule they had like I think June off which was like the the most fun month for us because that's when we had the end of year field trips and celebrations and all that like they had like the worst months off so anyways we both surmised that perhaps it was that parent preference those who had more involved parents perhaps or parents who were less disenfranchised and marginalized made the made the choice for their prefer, preferred schedule and those whose parents never mailed back the forms or whatever got the worst schedule so i just want to bring that up because whenever you start separating students whether it be by uh, school calendar schedule or small learning communities Depending on how that's done, there could be so much inequity baked into that that you got to be really, really, really careful. So, yeah, I know of a school in Sacramento right now that had small learning communities and one of them you had to apply for and the other ones you didn't. And guess what? That one is still to this day the elite academy. So, yeah, you got to watch out when you start separating kids, no matter if it's just a calendar issue or whatever. So, yeah. All right. I'll shut up. Well, fascinating story, Manuel. Thank you for sharing. And uh, double gold stars for you for using the word surmise uh, in, your, yeah. in your soliloquy there. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> Manuel, what's next for today's roll call? All right, Jeff. Next up on the roll call is the radical left. Mm, mm, wow. Is that... Is that me? <laughs> am, I, am I here today? <laughs> Probably. You already brought up uh, all the damage that Republicans did to our education system here in California. You so naturally bring up the toxicity and the just violence and chaos of, of Republican Party and Republican uh, policy leaders in education. I mean, so, uh, you know, so maybe if, it is if, you. If the shoe fits, then they must wear it that well. Indeed, indeed. But no, this, this uh, relates to a new law 
in California that some are saying is reflection of California being a radical left state. And this law now requires students at the California State University system, which is the largest college system in the nation, to now take an ethnic studies class in order to graduate. That's right. So the largest university system in the nation now requires all incoming freshmen to take an ethnic studies class in order to graduate. And this comes as a result of a new law that compels the 23 campus California State University system to require students to take a three unit class in either Native American studies, African American studies, Asian American studies or Latina and Latino studies. The new law will make California the first state in the nation to require ethnic studies as a university graduation requirement. And the university system's board of trustees have proposed its own ethnic studies graduation requirement that would have included so-called quote unquote social justice courses in classes that explore the history and culture of a range of communities that had experienced oppression, uh, such as Muslims or Jewish folks or LGBTQ people. But this CSU proposal was opposed by ethnic studies faculty members and the California Faculty Association, which is the faculty union. And um, this university system, Cal State University system, is the largest in the nation, as I mentioned. And it's been a leader in ethnic studies for quite some time. In 1969, the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University became the first college of its kind in the country. And Cal State Los Angeles created the first Chicano studies program in 1968. Every campus in the CSU system, except for one, offers at least one ethnic studies course. So Jeff, what do you think about this new graduation requirement that asks all incoming freshmen to take at least one course in ethnic studies in order to graduate? I absolutely love it, man. I think it's like one of the most uh, purely hopeful, exciting pieces of news that I've heard uh, in, you know, in like media in some time, man. It's about time we got a little bit of actual good news. So um, I love the policy. Um, I do recognize that like from an administrative perspective, when you add new graduation requirements, there's there's lots of ripple effect from that. Right. So it, it has implications around cost for students. It has implications around staffing in different departments in, in the universities. It has implications around length of time. It may or may not you know, um, impact how long it takes for students to graduate, things of that nature, right, which are not necessarily inconsequential. And we got all these other requirements. Like, you know, I, I think it is long overdue that ethnic studies is treated like what it is, which I think is an absolutely essential part of any, at least any liberal arts education, right? Um, one cannot be considered to be like generally literate in how America and our society functions if you have not taken a class like ethnic studies. And, and the sad, fact of the matter is that the, the reason we need ethnic studies is because our traditional humanities curriculum, right, our traditional curriculum in history classes and in sociology classes and in, um, you know, literature classes and other things has not done a good enough job at helping to really equip students with the knowledge and skills they need to, to develop a critical understanding of American history, which as we are all painfully aware now because of the mass protests that continue in the streets of this country to this day, um, you know, we have been unable to, to reconcile our, our tragic and oppressive past, uh, particularly on issues of race, gender, class, religion, other things, right? And so ethnic studies is but one piece of the pie, but it's an important one. And we can't continue to graduate people who haven't had these kind of learning experiences, right? And haven't been exposed to the vocabulary, the history, the sort of discipline and disposition of thinking through these critical lenses. So I love it. I think it's amazing. I hope it is a huge success. And, <laughs> you know, I think, I, I hope and, and think many other university systems around the country should and and hopefully will follow suit. Yeah, so I agree with all that for sure. I know some folks out there are like, "Oh, this is a this is a waste. This is a waste. This is radical left stuff." But um I mean, I mean it's just facts, all right? Whiteness has been so centered in every discipline that like you cannot fully come close to understanding racism in America, structural inequalities in America. You can't understand any of that 
unless you like break away from the centering of whiteness and explore the experiences of marginalized peoples. And ethnic studies is just that. Ethnic studies is interdisciplinary, so it's not just purely history. We got you know sociology and, and, and English and, and all other uh, a whole lot of other disciplines mixed within it. And it's it's the critical study of our nation through the experiences of people of color, folks who have been on on the losing end of white supremacy for for generations. And for this new law to pass um, just over 50 years um, since the largest student strike in American history at San Francisco State University, well, what's now called San Francisco State University, um, which ushered in the era of ethnic studies, at least in the formalized college sense. Uh, I mean, this is just great. It shouldn't have taken as long as it's taken, but it's just phenomenal for me. I know there's a lot of folks who are perhaps like STEM majors, like a computer science major who's like, oh, now I got to take another class. I already got the student loan debt. I'm trying to get out of here. Now I got to take this other class. Well, yes, you have to take this other class because you're about to go into, the, into a world that's so soaked in whiteness and white supremacy, especially when we talk about Silicon Valley and the tech world and, and the implicit bias that inherent in so many algorithms and all that you have a lot of these folks in these stem fields who who really believe that it's it's just all about hard work and and you know we talked about the model minority myth a few episodes back with dr shea those are some folks who need to be exposed to ethnic studies so they could see that for one the the humanization of these different marginalized groups and the raising of critical consciousness around the systemic systems and oppressive structures that have marginalized groups like you have to understand that so that when you go into this world you could do your part in helping dismantle it we've had so many corporate statements about black lives matter this and that whatever like we're not that's not going to mean anything if we don't actually do the 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 hard work and get down to the nitty gritty of what these systems are and how do we dismantle them. You can't do that without knowing something like, or without studying something like ethnic studies or, or any of these disciplines within it, because like, otherwise you're just, you're just talking. So anybody who's watching this, who's thinking like, oh, this is just a waste. This is just, you know, political propaganda, this, that, whatever. Like, no, first of all, like, to Jeff, to your point, like whiteness has been so centered in like the teaching of American history. And we're seeing the, the, the pushback and people rising up all summer against that. This reckoning is coming. And I'm so happy to see ethnic studies at the university level. And I am very excited about seeing it at the high school level because there's another bill in the works to create a graduation requirement for high schoolers in California to receive an ethnic studies class before they yeah. graduate. So that's going to be dope. Yeah, man. Well, I, so, yes, here's what I would say to the folks who are out there who are like, well, it's another requirement. Right. Yeah, I get that. That's a that's a perfectly legitimate critique. And I think the reasonable response and answer is. So what else among the requirements should we cut to make room for ethnic studies? Right. And I mean that in a very serious way. And I don't mean it to disparage other disciplines, but I mean to say, like, the fact of the matter is our current system produces our current reality. Right. We graduate folks who go out in the world and perpetuate these racist systems and then cops are killing black folks in the streets. Right. And like this is this is what's happening. Right. So if we want something better, if we if we want a different way of being as a society, we need to prioritize a different set of things. And making room for ethnic studies is within the, the realm of education, I think, one of the most important steps we can take in order to support more just outcomes and a more just society for all people. Right. So if that means we need to say, you know what, you don't need, uh, you know, four years of English. You need three years of English and one year of ethnic studies. Right. Or at the college level, you know, you you don't need, uh, you know, 25 different distributive requirements that you, you know, you have to take um, in all these different disciplines, you know, two or three or four of which might be within, you know, one sort of, uh, you know, humanities umbrella or whatever. Cut one of them and make room for ethnic studies, right? And I think if, if what we're saying is it's too much, okay, then what are we going to cut to make room for ethnic studies, right? And we could still have a robust, uh, well-rounded liberal arts education and make room for ethnic studies. We are morally compelled to do so. And the people who are uncomfortable by this are the very same people who need to take ethnic studies. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is for y'all big time. I, I was on the phone with... 
um, somebody, I won't, I won't say who, uh, recently, and they were asking me about ethnic studies because there's all this controversy over um, high school curriculum that's being developed at the state level for schools looking to embark on this journey of offering ethnic studies to their students. And this person, um, you know, in, in all sincerity said like, well, it really sounds like ethnic studies is just for students of color. Like, why should everybody else have to take it? And I had to no, clarify to the man. person, actually, it's definitely for students of color. So, you know, folks like, like how I was in school could see more humanizing representations of themselves and their culture and their history. But it's especially for folks who aren't exposed to that and don't live amongst communities of color and are just left with just believing these these negative deficit narratives that come out of you know everything from from media to to their own families it, it's for them too so if you are somebody who thinks like oh ethnic studies is a waste it's not it's not you know it's not rigorous it's not this it's not that man this class is for you big time all right because how else are you going to really explore and critically reflect on your views about these marginalized communities because we know you don't be kicking it with these communities so like where are you getting your information from i know where you're getting your information from jeff knows where you're getting your information from we're not gonna say it but hey ethnic studies for the win i'm so happy to see it here um yeah, super man. dope super dope super dope you know you know who needed an ethnic studies class in high school and in college manuel who's you that know who needed? ivanka trump uh jared kushner mike pence mitch mcconnell these are the people who need ethnic studies they just in elementary really hard, school, they just and middle really hard. school, you just... and high school, and three classes in college to drive home the point so that they can stop being such vicious, vile racists. Okay, like this. This is what it's. This is about right. Challenging systems of oppression and giving us a better version of education than we have otherwise gotten in this country. I love it. I can't wait to go back to school and take one of these classes again myself. Yeah, for sure. And shout out to Assembly Member uh, Shirley Weber. Uh, a few episodes ago, we talked about Prop 16, which gives California voters the option of bringing back uh, race conscious admissions and uh, various aspects of, of what is commonly known as affirmative action. Uh, she ushered that in and she also ushered in this this requirement for ethnic studies um, at the Cal State University level. So and she's an OG. She's been doing the work of African-American studies and fighting for that for ages. So shout out to her and all the other ethnic studies OGs who have been fighting for so long to make sure that our stories are, are honored and represented and told in an honest fashion. So super dope. All right. Also dope is today's seminar. And we're going to be diving into some of these, uh, some of these issues similarly about uh, decentering whiteness and uh, having more critical conversations about race in American society and American schools for sure. All right. So you don't want to miss that. That's up next. Stay tuned. What up, AOTA family? If you are listening to this episode on Apple Podcasts, we would very much appreciate it if you scroll down to the bottom and leave us a five-star rating. And when you have time, if you write us a little review, we would love that. In fact, if you write a review for us and screenshot it and send it to us, we will send you back an AOTA show sticker for your laptop or your notebook or wherever you put your stickers, all right? So write us a quick review, screenshot it, send it to us over Twitter or Facebook or wherever, and we will send you back an AOTA show sticker. We love y'all. Thanks for listening. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. We are so excited to have you with us today. And we have two incredible guests who are here and gonna help us unpack, I think, a topic that a lot of people are thinking about, talking about, tweeting about nowadays, which is kind of doing the work, right? We've, we've read the books, we've had the conversations about making schools anti-racist places and about decentering whiteness and challenging some of the historical paradigms under, under which we have all worked, um, but doing that work, right? And bringing it into practice um, in our classrooms. And today we're gonna be exploring that topic really specifically through the lens of thinking about uh, English language arts and thinking about reading and the texts that students are engaging with in class. And our two guests who are here are amazing, phenomenal people, uh, dope guests, keeping our, our dope guests streak alive. Uh, we have with us Julia Torres, and we have with us our senior middle school correspondent, Genevieve DuBose. Welcome to both of you. So excited to have you here with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Excited to be here with all of you. Thank you. 
All right, now let me tell you a little bit about our guest, folks. Um, Julia Torres is a veteran language arts teacher and currently serving as a teacher librarian for the Montebello Campus Library in the far northeast region of Denver Public Schools. Um, as a teacher activist committed to education as a practice of freedom, her practice is grounded in the work of empowering students to use language arts to fuel resistance and positive social transformation. Julia is currently serving as uh, educators on the executive boards and steering committee of the National Council of Teachers of English, the Book Love Foundation, and EduColor Collective. In cooperation with the Educator Collaborative, Julia facilitates workshops, professional conversations about anti-bias, anti-racist education, culturally sustaining pedagogies in, in the language arts, as well as digital literacy and librarianship. Her work has been featured in several publications, including NCTE's Council Chronicle, the New York Times Learning Network, the Chicago Tribune, ASCD's Education Update, the School Library Journal, Essence Magazine, QED Mindshift, and many, many more. And I think from that, you can see why we're so excited to have, here us, uh, have her here with us um, today. So uh, welcome, Julia. Thanks for bringing your talents with uh, to today's conversation. And of course, we have back with us once again, our senior middle school correspondent, Genevieve DuBose, uh, one of my favorite people and favorite colleagues uh, to bring her many, many years of expertise to today's conversation. And just as a quick reminder, Genevieve is not only our senior middle school correspondent, but so much more. She's a career teacher, a teaching tolerance board member. She's the founder of Project Lit Watts, which is bringing amazing conversations about text to the middle school students um, in Watts here in Los Angeles. Uh, she runs marathons, she raps, and she leaps tall buildings in a single bound. Uh, <laughs> welcome back, Genevieve, to all the above. Thank you. What a great, I, I love that. She runs marathons and she raps. I'm putting that in a rap. I love that. <laughs> we, we've love had, that we've had a couple of your verses here on, on the show, uh, Genevieve. We had your, your graduation um, piece. For, yeah, yeah. So the, the audience has, uh, has been blessed once before. Awesome. Indeed. All right. So again, thank you both for being here. There's a lot of a lot of dopeness in the building today, and we're going to be uh, unpacking some of the discussions around English language arts curriculum, especially in this in this uh, age where anti-racism has become sort of the 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 word of the summer among educators and in, in educator circles. And a lot of folks have have read this book or that book or watched this webinar and that webinar. But when it comes down to the the actual in classroom work. Of, of being anti-racist and being inclusive and uplifting um, students of all backgrounds and, and decentering whiteness, a lot of folks still have trouble making that a reality. So I guess our first question really is, you know, I'll direct it to you, Julia, when it comes to the recent shifts and changes with adopting more recent literature for the, the ELA classroom as curriculum, um, I was wondering if you could describe a little bit of that to me, because my memories of being a, a student in an English class, the, the books were old, the curriculum was old, and I think recently there's been some shifts there with regards to what literature is used as, as curriculum. So I was wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit of that to us. Absolutely. I can tell you that my experience was just like yours. I remember a textbook, language arts textbook, and I remember that I read excerpts from different books and then had to do the chapter questions and then do the vocabulary and that yeah. was it. So doing school was really something that I learned to be very good at. Um, I did, however, have a traumatizing experience reading Huckleberry Finn in school with a teacher who required that the class basically read the whole book out loud. So every day we were sitting there in a circle. I still remember kind of how it went. And it was not about popcorning or skipping your turn or saying I'm uncomfortable reading. Everybody took their turn reading. I was the only black student in a room full of white students. And I remember where I was sitting in that classroom because I wanted to get up and leave every time we had to read Huckleberry Finn because listening to all the folks reading the N word over and over again was a traumatic experience. So nowadays we have something that we call curriculum violence. And um, some folks claim that curriculum violence is um, you know, something you can, you can turn and shift depending on the audience. 
But teaching tolerance talks about curriculum violence as a, a way of um, enacting harm or perpetuating systems of oppression through the curriculum that we choose to adopt. So one of the things that I have been working with various folks for various years to try to get um, to be more commonplace is that we want folks to shift not only what they teach, but how they teach it. Shifting what you teach is probably easier, right? Even though adopting curriculum often takes years and years to do. Um, we know that there have been movements to get like Jessamine Ward on um, 11th grade curriculum uh, in outside of Baltimore, um, Scott Bayer, I believe, I hope I pronounced his last name. I call him Scott. I don't call him Mr. Bear, <laughs> but he, um, he worked really hard to get uh, Jessamine Ward and several other authors of color on the curriculum several years ago. I would say about two or three years ago that initiative um, went through. And so along with that goes the work of understanding how we got to this place where the books that we always come back to are predominantly by dead white male authors and the books that folks consider to be necessary pieces of cultural capital are the books by white authors telling or centering the stories of white people, either historic or present. And so people of color begin to be marginalized or erased in these narratives or often just flat out misportrayed. So it's the work is twofold, right? It's replacing the text, but then it's also interrogating your own bias and examining how we got here in the first place and why so much of it still remains. Because I'll tell you right now, you hear about the success stories of people who are able to adopt new text into the curriculum, but there are still many, many, many states and cities where the summer reading is not that. And where, you know, the reading that they expect students to graduate knowing is still from the quote unquote Western canon. So, you know, though we can have these conversations in somewhat fringe or radical spaces about adopting more recently published books and those by authors of color, um, it's really important to remember that there are still a lot of folks who do not subscribe to um, the text adoption that we are trying to promote. And we need to help link arms with them and help them understand why it is that they are so anti-progress when it comes to the books that our students read, not only for fun, not only as part of a multicultural lit class, but to study as works of art and to learn from. Hmm. Yeah, Genevieve, I would love to get your take on this as well, because I know, um, especially through your the work you've done with, with Project Lit and kind of I guess you might say uh, having sort of a parallel curriculum to the curriculum, uh, you know, bringing lots of, you know, contemporary texts by authors of color, you know, authors who speak to the experiences of, of your students. That's been a big driving force of, of your work. So I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about the, the importance of this and, and the work of doing that as well. Absolutely. Um, I mean, what is resonating with me based on what uh, Julia just said, but also just in our context is like, what is happening in the world today, right? When you look at who is inhabiting 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, clearly that person was not a reader. And if they did read, they read texts that were the ones that Julia was describing, right? And then you look at what's happening in the streets. And this is like a racial reckoning in our country of people essentially saying, that we have been erased, right? We have been erased and you are continuing to erase us. And so the what is happening right now really resonates with me because so much of our schooling is how we are socialized. And if we are giving kids the message uh, and all kids, and I'm not just talking about kids of color, but if we're giving white students also the message that only these authors matter and only these voices are important, then we are just going to continue to have more of what is existing today in terms of the upheaval and the ignorance and the racism and the hatred that's um, happening in our country right now. And so uh, for me, it's, it's work, it, it, it may sound uh, dramatic, but it is life and death work, right? Like what kids read and how we teach students influences them for 13 years of their lives when they are mandated to go to school, right? And that is crucial in terms of us ensuring that we are not only letting students, um, giving students, sharing with them access 
to texts that represent them, but also that represent a range of identities, right? Because if we are putting on a pedestal that this Shakespeare piece or this piece by Mark Twain, which is causing harm and violence to children, all children in that space, um, is the text that should be up on a pedestal, that's definitely uh, a recipe for destruction and disaster, which is what we're seeing now. And so for me, it's just, it's, crucial and critical that we ensure, and like Julia said, we bring along those folks who aren't quite where some of us are in terms of recognizing that it is a matter of survival and it is a matter of thriving for our nation to ensure that we are e pluribus unum, like out of many one, that many of our voices are recognized and celebrated and shared in an authentic way. And so for me, it's, it's, it really comes down to a matter of, of survival and thriving. Yeah. Now, I, I do want to just try to correct, uh, correct the record briefly there, if I could, Genevieve, because I, I believe the inhabitant of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue did at one time say that his favorite book was the Bible and that oh. his favorite part of that book was 2 Corinthians. So as all of the um, you know avid readers of the Bible out there know, he's uh, he must be very, very well read in that particular text, mm -hmm. at least. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think part of what excited Manuel and I by having the both of you on the show today uh, is you are folks who are English teachers, but also who are folks who work with English teachers and work with other teachers uh, more generally to kind of enrich the experiences that students are having with text and with exploring text um, as a part of their education. And um, so I'm wondering if you can share with us some of your insight about you know, what things you're doing or what advice you might give to other folks who are coaches or working with um, working with teachers about how to actually do the work of kind of challenging the, you know, the sort of standard set of texts um, and, you know, how to actually like operationalize bringing into their, you know, into their curriculum, into the experiences with students, um, a different, broader, more representative set of, of text to shape the, the curriculum. And um, perhaps Julia, we'll start with you. So I was um, very honored to be able to join the Book Love Foundation board um, this year. And so Penny Kittle has a foundation called the Book Love Foundation. And there's several folks who are a part of it, but it's really, it's into Canada. It's all across the United States. And what's really awesome about it is that I get to work with folks who just recently got their money for classroom libraries because Book Love has been giving out money for classroom libraries for a long time. But now I get to work with these folks to try to support them having inclusive libraries and then also doing the work at the building level of getting folks to think more expansively about the reason that these books have not been considered worthy of academic study in the first place, right? Because that's part of the work is that we have to do it in community with other people. So I have various communities that I'm a part of and you do need to be able to have that support Right? You have to feel like you are supported in order to be able to do it because doing it alone is exhausting and often it's not sustainable. But then you've also got to do that individual piece, the individual internal work. So what does that look like? That means that each one of us has to be able to say, okay, how am I perpetuating these systemic oppression by either being a part of the conversation or saying I'm not going to be a part of the conversation? Um, some of the conversations that I have locally are with my independent bookstore. The, there's three in town that are the biggest ones. So I have conversations with them about diversity, representation, inclusivity within their people who they bring into the bookstore, their team programming, all of those kinds of things, authors that they invite, um, all of that. But then I also like to do work in my building. I had a professional development session two weeks ago about anti-racist education and we kind of initially wanted to separate it into the 101 and the 102 because we're not all entering into this work from the same space. So it's really important, no matter where you are geographically, um, to just acknowledge that we are all dealing with the after effects of living in a colonized world 
But then because I was able to talk to some folks who are from a global audience this summer as well. And there were folks in South America who were talking about the impact of colonization on what is considered worthy of academic study in school. Um, so this isn't just something that we have here in the United States. But the unpacking has to be done at a, an individual level and then also on the community level. So, you know, that means that you've got to do the anti-racist book club at your at your school. But then going beyond the performative piece of posting the picture of the book that you read for the anti-racist book club is that internal work of like, how are your practices different? How are you relating to students in a different way? How is, is your teaching different now based on your recognition of the systemic oppression that you either contribute to or benefit from? Because the majority of the teaching force is white. And that's something that we all have to reconcile. There's a reason for that. Children of color are often harmed in the school system. So why would they then want to become teachers? Children of color do not often see themselves or didn't when we were young as authors. So that's, you know, the, the ones that we have now that are emerging are miraculous in a way because they succeeded despite all of the systemic pressures telling them that they should not be great. They're great anyway and continue to be great and continue to inspire our young people to know that they can do that too. So I could keep going forever, but I'll, I'll stop there. I'd love to add on to that um, with, I cannot emphasize enough how, like how vital that, that internal work is, right? Because we uh, reading, and I, and I wanna talk a little bit about Goldie Muhammad's uh, book, um, Cultivating Genius, because there's a piece in that book where she says, you know, I, I know that the teachers who ask me immediately like, oh, just show me how to do it, are the ones that are like, they haven't done that internal work, right? And so it is so important knowing that that work is ongoing. And so um, that's, all, yeah, that's a piece of the work. But for me as, as a literacy coach, um, once or as we are doing that internal work, um, additionally, I, that's part of my, like the best part of my job, I feel like is because I am supporting a team of about 10 um, ELA teachers at my, at my middle school um, with planning, with delivery of instruction, with looking at student work and all of that. Um, I feel like in the planning, that is a great place for us to, um, to figure out how do we work within this existing curriculum that the district is saying we, we have to use. Uh, to ensure that it is one that is more culturally sustaining, culturally relevant, and historically responsive. And so using um, Goldie Muhammad's work of Cultivating Genius has been something that we've been working with our teams around. And it's been really powerful um, to use her framework uh, to look at our existing units and then think think through how do we need to revise or shift or change these units. So for people that may not be familiar with her work, she really has um, these four um, components. Uh, and it's around uh, how, does this, how is this uh, work going to develop students' identity, going to develop their skills, going to develop their intellect, and their criticality. And so looking through those four lenses at a unit, looking at the text that this mandated, you know, McGraw-Hill curriculum says should be in this unit, we go through a series of questions that she provides in her book around, are these texts gonna help my students develop their own identities and or learn about the identities of others? Uh, she has one question that I love, which is something to the effect of like, is this text going to agitate the oppressors, right? Which I'm like, yeah, that's the best question on that list of 13. And, um, and so we go through to select our text to ensure that we do have like, hey, we're missing Latinx voices from women, right? So then we need to do the work to go and ensure that we have a text that connects to our theme and our essential question that represents whose voices are not present. And then to really think through, and this is what I, what I, where the fun part comes in for me as, as a coach, how do we then ensure we've got our text, we've got our essential question, we've got our theme for the unit, well, what are we actually going to do with students with these texts to ensure that they can develop their skills, their identity, their intellect, and their criticality? And so some of that has also been in supporting, like thinking, how is this actually apply to students' lives and to the world around them? Are there things that, where they can be engaging with the community or the community and families can be engaging with them 
to deepen their knowledge and their, their um, expertise in this area. Um, and I will also say one last piece has been, for a lot of teachers, I find that people need models, right? They need to see some examples of what this looks like in practice. And so I spent some time creating some samples. We pulled from other places where you can see what does it look like when you actually are working with students uh, in a way where they can continue to think critically, to like deepen their knowledge, their skills, their intellect, their, their identity, um, using text as, as, their, as their basis and their foundation. So um, for me, that's really, it's like the power of the self-work, the planning, um, using frameworks like Goldie Muhammad's, and then also giving folks examples so they can see what it looks like. Because sometimes I think many of us, many teachers, we feel like stuck because you're like, oh, well, this is what I have to teach. But it, I know it doesn't feel right, uh, but I'm not sure how to proceed. So those are some of the things that we've done. Yeah, and that's all. I mean, there's so much wealth and richness in what both of you just shared. And I think there's probably plenty of teachers who are listening to this who feel perhaps they have some guidance in, in how to go about this, this journey, this path. But at some point, they might run into a parent of a student who who whose view of the situation is a little bit different. So I was wondering if we could shift the conversation a little bit to the, the families. Now, there are plenty of families, plenty of black families, in fact, that will see a syllabus from a teacher with these inclusive texts and this anti-racist lens and think that is all well and good, but I need my student to go off to college. And in college, that student needs to know about these these classics like the Crucible or, or 1984. So when it comes to that conversation about so-called like cultural capital and, and and knowing the 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 white foundation classics in order to to succeed in college and beyond, I guess I, I'm curious. How do we build buy-in from folks who who are skeptical about how college ready or successful a student might be if they aren't really just studying those 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 classics in their ELA classes? I'll go ahead and address that. I think that it's so important to remember, and I, I actually have personal experience with this, so I can speak to it. I came into Montbello um, as a language arts teacher, and the majority of my students were Latinx, so they were bilingual. Some, um, I had a few students that were monolingual English speakers, and what wound up happening was that folks didn't opt into AP Lang with me. That was just the honors track so to speak, because our program was so small and tracking was a reality for us. And so I looked at the syllabus and I, of course, when you're an AP teacher, you have to create your own syllabus. And I thought, okay, exactly what um, Jean-Viev said, how are you going to not perpetuate the systems of oppression with your syllabus? So a lot of the conversation that I had with parents was they needed to, I needed to get their trust that I would be able to teach the skills, not necessarily the text. So then you can apply the skills to whatever text. Now, when it comes to the argument of cultural capital and that someone won't be considered literate or knowledgeable because they can't speak in all of these illusions and metaphors um, that are found in, you know, Macbeth or, or the Crucible, as you said, or what have you. Um, I do think that, first of all, the, the last question on the AP Lit test um, was changed a few years ago to where you could just write about any text or you could write about the ones that were on the list. So you could use the skills that you knew about to analyze literature for any text that you had read, which means you could use long way down if you wanted to. If you learned about poetry and different poetic terminology with that text, you could then apply it to that last question on the AP test. So I was strongly geared to focus on skills, not texts. And that is something that a lot of my colleagues talk about. And that is something that you know, I think we're shifting gradually in that direction, but I hear you when parents think that their kid is going to head off to college and be tested on something um, that they don't know, they start to feel insecure. Now, one thing that we have to remember is that our higher ed people are also having these conversations about inclusive texts and inclusive literature and the value of cultural capital, shifting cultural capital, cultural capital from various um, diasporas or various groups. And one thing that I know is that a student who is an English major, for example, can choose what types of English classes they wanna take. Then they will have texts that they have to read, then they will write about those texts. So 
I have never heard of somebody just being expected to come into a college course and then they're expected to have this wealth of knowledge about, for example, um, To Kill a Mockingbird from 10th grade and apply that to studies in the early years of post-secondary education. So I think that a lot of what needs to happen is that unpacking of the reality from the myth that we've created for ourselves and then our own experiences, which for some of us were 20, 30, maybe even 40 years ago in higher ed. So that's some work that I think is ongoing. Yeah, and I, I, uh, <laughs> I also have some personal experience with this. I feel like I'm experiencing some of this now with, within my family. Um, and thinking of my nieces and nephews and, and, and some of the, uh, the schooling that they're experiencing. But I, 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 what comes to me right now is just that there are so many ways to build cultural capital, right? And, and the fact that we are existing in this society that is a white supremacist society, we are being exposed to whiteness and like all the time, right? So when I think about, um, you know, those parents that might be like, well, my kid needs uh, to have read To Kill a Mockingbird. My kid needs Shakespeare uh, to, to be comfortable in those spaces. Um, I mean, I'm not, an, I'm not a fan of the argument, well, I did it, so, so can you, but I was like, I, I never read Shakespeare. I actually never read To Kill a Mockingbird. I've seen it on Broadway, but I'm not interested in reading the book. But the, the, what I think about is like, I go back to thinking about, well, why do we think that this text is superior to another great American work. And my, anyone who knows me knows that my favorite book of all time is Richard Wright's Black Boy. And I read that book as a 10th grader for the first time because my English teacher, who I think was, when I reflect, a little bit racist, um, one thing he did do a good job of was allow us choice. And I, I, it discovered Richard Wright's work and just dove into it. And when you look even at, excuse me, the beginning, the first like 30 pages of that book, the stories that this writer tells and the craft with which he tells those stories is incredible. And his word choice, his description, his dialogue, if I am asked telling a family, right, a black family, like if we want our kids to know what it's like to read and analyze and think through and enjoy good, strong writing, like look no further than Richard Wright because here is a black American author who can go toe to toe with any of these canonical texts written by white men who maybe existed in his time or before him. Um, and so just to, to think, I think sometimes it's also about exposure and recognizing that we may have all been taught this and, and asked to drink this Kool-Aid, but we don't, you know, there's so much more outside of this that is just as valid and just as worthy and maybe even better. And so uh, Richard Wright, I gotta give a plug to Black Boy because I still use that text with middle schoolers. They, I share excerpts from like when he burned down his grandparents' house at the age of four, because he was bored and started to play with fire and then went to hide under the burning house. Um, you know, like a four-year-old would do, kids are like, miss, I want to read this book. I, I said, great, let's go to the library and let's get it. So just, I think that exposure to like the, the range and, and beauty of texts that, that exist. I want to back up to what you said just about, you know, how there is actually a, a rich cultural capital of historical greatness within communities that are not white. And that's been excluded from the curriculum. So that's another thing that parents can think about or that we can, another talking point for us with parents is that it's not as though all of the classics were the only ones. There were some classics like Their Eyes Were Watching God and um, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. You know, there were some classics that, were de that are deliberately excluded from curriculum due to censorship and due to the deliberate centering of the white cultural capital. So I wanted to add on to what you said there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, I mean, we we had a guest a few episodes ago, Dr. Uh, Richard Reddick, who's at the University of Texas, who who pointed out the importance of of educators being familiar with uh, Terry Yoso and community cultural wealth, and in the the fact that regardless of what well, in discussions about cultural capital, there's so much wealth that students of color bring and and their um, families bring that, you know, it's it's very important that higher ed, to your point, Julia, about uh, folks in higher ed having these conversations too, it's very important to acknowledge that 
the the traditional view of cultural capital and whose culture has capital definitely definitely needs to be interrogated at all levels um, for sure. I came to know Genevieve over pancakes. Yeah, we hanging out, you know, <laughs> just connecting. Um, and I think that is such great community to be had. Folks really want to do right by kids. I want to believe that. I have to believe that. I want to believe that. I hold on to it. Um, but I also feel like there's a reluctance to leave behind tradition and structures that have worked for us historically or that we thought have worked for us. And really, when we say have worked for us, they've worked for us, the adults, not so much for the kids. So now that we're in the time of uh, coronavirus and virtual learning, I think that it's all going to fall apart in some ways because we're really going to see how badly we have not been serving our, our students um, or how badly we've underserved our students. And so this is a great time. This is probably one of the best times to get rid of what has not served our students and do what will and try new things and work in collaboration with our students. Is this working for you? Are you learning this? Do you understand why you're learning this? Is this relevant to your life? These are questions that we need to ask them. Because if we're just continuing to do what we have been taught to do, or continuing to do what someone else tells us has importance for our students, then that's not really serving them. So I'll just add that piece there. I think it's so important to do this work in, in connection with them. And it has to be the work of empowerment, not the work of compliance. And that goes for us too. Don't just take a list that somebody gives you. Make sure you do your research and your knowledge about why these texts are on here. As jean have said, it's important for you to understand why you're teaching what you're teaching. You know, you've got to do that internal work. So yeah, that's it. Boom. I think that's, I think that's a mic drop moment right there. Uh, <laughs> super Agreed. dope, super dope. Well, thank you both again for, for being on our show and, and Genevieve for continuing to be our senior middle school correspondent. And I hope everything is going well um, with the middle schoolers um, in this, this beginning of virtual mm -hmm. learning for the 2020-2021 school year for you, for sure. And, um, and folks, um, check out our previous episodes with Gene Genevieve, which we'll link under this, under this uh, video here. And we'll also shoot down some, shoot some links at you related to the webinars that Julia has been part of this summer. I know I watched quite a few of them and I was uh, very much, very much uh, appreciative of all the knowledge that she shared there. Um, and that about does it for today's seminar. Up next will be Class Dismissed, where we take a look at folks doing great things in the world of education. Stay tuned. Hey folks, thanks for being a big supporter of all the above. We really appreciate it and we need your help. All you need to do is go to aotashow.com slash support. That's aotashow.com slash support. There you can chip in via Venmo, via Cash App, or most importantly, you can go to our anchor page and subscribe there. Everything you can do to help us helps us put together incredible content here on All the Above and make sure you're getting the best each and every week. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of the show. All right, folks, we have reached that point in the episode where we like to give shout outs to folks doing wonderful things in the world of education. All right. So, Jeff, who do we got today? Well, Manuel, you know, we were kind of racking our brains trying to think of who was deserving of a shout out uh, for today's episode. And I think both of us were kind of like, stuff is so wild right now yeah. that it's hard to identify, you know, one person or one school or, you know, one group. Um, the reality is uh, educators across this country, and we're talking teachers, we're talking principals, we're talking assistant principals, we're talking, you know, school aides, uh, you know, nurses, right? Yeah. All of the folks in schools across this country who have taken on the Herculean task of figuring out how, how in whatever context you're operating in, right? Whether you're virtual, whether you're hybrid, whether you're, you know, heaven help you, uh, fully physical at this point, yeah. uh, you know, how to make it work, right? And how to create meaningful connections, relationships for kids. 
um, how to create supports for families, and how to support one another as a community of educators to, to really persevere through what has to be one of the most challenging uh, you know, periods of time in the history of our profession. And so it's just a big shout out to all the folks who are starting back up, all the folks who are, you know, learning new tools, um, reaching out to families and making those, you know, connections between school and home in, in ways that are even more uh, important than ever before. Um, you know, leading on your campus and helping to create cohesion and adult community, all of that critically important. And we just want to say, hey, hats off to you, um, we know this is a, a difficult time. Keep your head up, prioritize that self-care, and, um, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. Yeah, all that. And in the words of the great philosopher, Marshawn Lynch, take care of y'all mentals. Indeed. This is, this is <laughs> a heck of a year right now. So shout out to all of you educators, especially if you're listening to this and your first day of school is like this week, then absolutely um, shout out to you. And um, yeah, we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. All right, folks, that about does it for this episode of All of the Above. If you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button and follow the show so that you don't miss any of the upcoming super dope episodes that we have for you. All right. Take care.